Dear friends, it is a huge privilege for me to be here in the same room as so many wonderful people, including the two we have just heard, uh, uh, the laureates and uh, all the other speakers that uh, have spoken so far. And I'm delighted to be back in Oslo with the Nobel Peace Committee and to be here with so many friends and acquaintances to celebrate the work of human rights defenders. It is something that we don't do often enough, too frequently focusing on all the terrible injustices and violations that they face. This, of course, is absolutely necessary. And the more we understand about the risks that human rights defenders face, the better placed we are to develop protection strategies with them. Yet taking time to step back and acknowledge the contribution of human rights defenders is also necessary. Doing so can remind us why it is so important to champion human rights defenders in our everyday lives and what we would risk losing without their work. I have always believed that hope and solidarity builds resilience in human rights defenders, in their fierce determination to help build just and equal societies, brick by brick, despite the threats, the intimidation, and the attacks that they face. Hope, as Vaclav Havel said, is an orientation of the spirit an orientation of the heart. It transcends the world that is immediately experienced and it is anchored somewhere beyond the horizon. Its deepest roots are in the transcendental, just as the roots of human responsibility are. To mark the 25th anniversary of the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders, this year, I presented a report to the Human Rights Council on some of the successes achieved by human rights defenders in those 25 years. Part of it was to show their impact, but mostly, as well, I wanted to honour them. One of the objectives of the report was to, was to demonstrate the vastness of their work that they are engaged in, and the social good that comes from that work. Take, for example, the work of human rights defenders in fighting for gender equality. In Indonesia last year, women defenders played a vital role in passing a law criminalizing physical sexual abuse, including in marriage, sexual or exploitation, forced marriage, including of children, and the circulation of non-consensual sexual content. Such work has impact that swells beyond the borders of where that work is taking place. We know, for instance, that states which have greater gender equality are less likely to use military force to resolve disputes with other states. While there has been much talk recently about the reversals in the rights of women and LGBTI people, in preparing the report, it struck me time and time again the remarkable gains that LGBTI defenders have made in the past quarter centre. From Belize to Botswana, from uh, San Lucia to Sri Lanka and elsewhere, Discriminatory laws and practices have been challenged and defeated in campaigns organized and led by LGBTI defenders. This acceptance is very motivating and positive. But also, studies have shown positive correlation between LGBTI inclusion and a country's economic development. When LGBTI people are treated equally, we all do better. The work done by human rights defenders in conflict zones, particularly relevant today, is vital to maintaining a rules-based 
international order, where their documentation of war crimes and other violations can be used to hold perpetrators accountable in the future. But they also save lives. The Abductee Mothers Association in Yemen is a group made up of female relatives of men who've been disappeared in the conflict. Through their persistent efforts, their courage and their innovation, they have succeeded in securing the release of dozens of unjustly detained people by both sides in the conflict and establishing the whereabouts of many more. Closer to home here in Europe, where attitudes to refugees, migrants and asylum seekers have become so hardened that people drowning is just normalized. I've spoken to scores of human rights defenders in Greece, in Italy and in France and elsewhere who are being criminalized for saving lives. These human rights defenders remind us of our shared humanity and how, how far we have fallen. And I'd like to recognize Tommy Olsen, a human rights defender from, uh, from Norway, uh, who has been working in Greece, whose case I've taken up. We know also Polish volunteers on the country's border with Belarus who have been threatened and intimidated for providing food and shelter to migrants, refugees and asylum seekers. And these vulnerable people have been so in cruelly instrumentalized by the Belarusian government. When I asked one young Polish woman, human rights defender, why she took the risks that she was taking, she simply replied, I just couldn't not act. This for me sums up what it means to be a human rights defender. People who are simply unable to turn away when they see injustice. This is where we need to get back to, and it is the human rights defenders who are doing the signposting. Young defenders have also led the way in forcing the climate crisis onto the international agenda. In June of this year, I convened a meeting of 40 youth and children who are human rights defenders, working on a whole range of issues, including uh, climate justice. One of those was a 13-year-old boy from Colombia who has become an eloquent spokesperson on the right of children to have a say in an issue which is going to have a huge impact on their lives. Because he has been so vocal, Francisco has had to relocate to Spain as a result of the threats that he faced, but he continues to be an extremely effective advocate and a reminder that children must be involved in these conversations. It is sometimes easy to despair when you hear stories like this, where a 13-year-old boy has had to leave his father, his friends and his school and his home because of his human rights activities. In such times, I reflect on the winds, and there are so many of them for defenders, and what negative things wouldn't happen, what negative things didn't happen because of human rights defenders. I think, for instance, of Rani Yanyan, an indigenous, indigenous human rights defender from the Chittagong Hill Tracks in Bangladesh. There, the Bangladeshi army wanted to build a five-star hotel and resort in the area, threatening the local water supply and the displacement of 10,000 Mro persons. Rani Yanyan helped organize young people to consult with local villagers, and they did so in the dead of night when everybody else was asleep, so as to avoid surveillance. She and others publicized internationally what was happening, and the military now seems to have backed off from the project. Through imagination and perseverance, hope and solidarity, human rights defenders continue to succeed against intimidating odds, and often despite threats and attacks. These victories are usually the result of long-term struggles 
and are typically achieved in collaboration with other human rights defenders and with a broad range of allies. Finally, let me say to all human rights defenders everywhere, including those gathered here today, I salute your courage, your persistence, your hope, your resilience and your vision of a better world. When I think of you, I am reminded of the words of an Irish playwright, George Bernard Shaw, which you embody for me. Life is no brief candle for me. It is a sort of splendid torch, which I have got hold of for the moment. And I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lawler.